Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with the star and Lily back there. And as always, I'd like to remind you to please stay safe and healthy. Hit the notification bell, hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. Today, we are going to get back into Rudy Rucker's Infinity and the Mind, The Science and Philo the Philosophy of Inf the Infinite by Rudy Rucker. So we're still in Chapter 1. <clears throat> We are on the absolute infinite, infinite. Let's see here. Okay, the absolute infinite. There was a certain type of non-physical entity that was not discussed in the last, last section. God, the cosmos, the mindscape, and the class V of all sets. All these are versions of what philosophers call the absolute the word absolute is used here in the sense of non-relative, non-subjective. An absolute exists by itself and in the highest possible degree of completeness. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, Plotinus held that what the one could not be limited in any sense. As a Okay, Th As, okay Thomas Aquinas, sorry. I just read that, I should know that. As Aquinas, the quintessential theologian says, the notion of form is most fully realized in existence itself, and in God, and in God, existence is not acquired by anything, but God is existence held subsistent. It is clear then that God Himself is both limitless and perfect. The limitlessness of God is expressed in a form closer to the mathematical infinite by Saint Gregory. No matter how far our mind may have progressed in the contemplation of God, it does not attain to what he is, but to what he is, what is beneath him. We have here the rudiments of the infinite dialect, dialectic process that takes place if we systematically try to build up an image of the whole mindscape. Suppose that I want to add thought after thought to my mind until my mind fills the whole mindscape. Whenever I make an attempt at this, I am collecting together a group of thoughts into a single thought, T. Now when I become conscious of my state of mind, T, I realize that this is a new thought that I had not yet accounted for. So I have improved my image of the mindscape by go passing to the thought that includes all the elements of T plus T itself, viewed objectively. And, and I mean, as far as I'm concerned, God is everything. He is the universe, and the universe is Him. And His there. So... And the, and the universe is made up of mathematics, so God, God is, well, very difficult to describe, obviously, but the best way I can see it as is he's everything, you know, meaning he's He's all the universe, uh, he's the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything, And he, but he's also a, th a and of course he's really not a gender, but he's all the living things but with he's also a singular thought too because but that's how complex it is that he he just encompasses everything but he does have its own it does have its own thought it's it it's not exactly the way they just the bible's kind of i'm not saying the bible's bad it's not real but it's set in in a way that's easier for your layman to understand but they try to describe God in the sense that it makes it easier for people to understand because it's hard for people to, to fathom. That's why we, they say we can't see God because, well, how could you? I mean, it'd be in everything. You'd, of course, it would blind you. It would, you know, you'd, you'd disintegrate because he is everything. But let me get off that and get back where I was at. So I improved my image of the mindscape by passing to the thought that includes all the elements of T plus T itself viewed objectively. This is a dialectic process in the sense that the aesthetic co component in one's instantaneous unconscious image of the absolute, the antithetic component is the conscious formalization of this image and the synthetic component is the formation of a new unconscious image of the absolute that incorporates one's earlier image and the awareness that they are inadequate. This process is most clearly understood if we start with 
nothing at all, as in the cartoon strip of Willy, Willy in um, figure 32. That must be the, that's figure 32, which means the next uh, page here. Yeah. Okay. Can we lose it? Willy Willy is a character whose adventures I occasionally used to draw for the Rutgers Daily Targum when I was in graduate school there. That'd be Rudy Rucker. Notice that in each of the shifts, what takes place in the Willy Willy forms a thought that has its members by members the members of the last thought plus the last thought itself looked in another way. The thought of each stage has all of the previous stages as components. If we call the NTH thought T, we can define T in two ways. On the one hand, we can use an inductive de definitions, definitions to equals zero with a and TN one equals TNU, the T is it's mathematical things. I never really did do calculus. I know I can learn it if I tried. We have for any sets A and B, A, U, B, means the set of all the sets that are members of A or, or B. On the other hand, we can use a different sort of inductive definition, Tn equals Tmm, uh, more of those, how's that? <laughs> more of the calculations, I'll show you, I'm just reading it, which means T is the set of all T such that M is less than the N, than N. Some readers may have asked themselves that the thought T plus T really has to be different from the thought T, and the answer is not always. In the last section, we were looking at a mind, which has M as one of its components, such as such an M is already fully aware, and M plus M is no different from M in terms of sets. Yeah, I never found mathematics interesting till I started doing a lot of reading, realizing. Well, I've always read, but started realizing that that's also. Mathematics also encompasses everything, universe, God, they all correlate. So I started finding it more fascinating then when I could see that everything intertwined and correlated. It would seem in particular that God should be able to form a precise mental image of himself insofar as the mindscape is God's mind. What I am saying is that one of the objects in the mindscape should be the mindscape itself, that is the mindscape, is an M that has M as one of its members. Now any object in the mindscape is in principle something that one can perceive through one's consciousness. So it would seem to be possible for our minds actually to attain a vision of God or of the whole mindscape. Now this seems to contradict St. Gregory's dictum and the general feeling that the absolute is unknowable. But there are two kinds of knowing, the rational, rational and the mystical. The rational is in the, is I think we carry around with us in our everyday physical life. But then there's mystical when you get to the spiritual. If I know seem something rationally, then I have something, some thought that is built up from similar thoughts, which are in turn built up from all still simpler thoughts. This regress is not infinite, but goes only through some finite number of stages before stage before certain simple and unanalyzable perceptions and ideas are reached. My idea of house consists of a collection of ideas, each one of which represents a certain type of house, e.g. my house, brick house, hubble. Each idea of a type of house consists of ideas of various components and functions, doors, windows, shelter, which can in turn be ex <coughs> ex in terms of certain simple ideas, Walk, uh, walking, vision, warmth. When I communicate a rational thought, what I do first is to show what the components of my thoughts are, and then to show how the components fit together. If one of the components of the final thoughts would be the final thought itself, then this rational communication would be blocked by an infinite regress. To explain the thought, I would first have to explain the thought. I would could not finish unless I have had already finished. In terms of rational thoughts, the absolute is unthinkable. There is a non-circular way to reach it from below. 
any real knowledge of the absolute must be mystical. If indeed such a thing as mystical knowledge is possible. Then you have to really go deep within yourself. Mathematics and philosophy do not normally have a great deal to say about the mystical way of knowing things. Mystically speaking, it is possible to experience a direct vision of the whole mindscape. This vision cannot be rationally communicated for the reasons just outlined. Of course, it is possible to communicate mystical knowledge in an indirect way, for example, by advocating that a person prepare his or her mind through carrying out some physical or spiritual exercises. <clears throat> but ultimately, mystical knowledge is attained all at once or not at all. There is no gradual path by which to build up an M that has M as one of its elements. Even if full knowledge of the Absolute is only possible through <clears throat> mysticism, it's still possible and worthwhile to discuss partial knowledge of the Absolute rationally. A significant thing about the Mindscape and the other Absolutes is that they are actually infinite. Indeed, in, in 1887, Cantor's friend Richard Dedekind published a proof that the Mindscape is infinite, where Dedekind's word for Mindscape was Geden Kawelt, some sort of Germanic, meaning through, wor through world. Dedekind's argument for the infinite infinitude of the mindscape was that if S is a thought, then so is S a, is a possible thought, so that if S is some rational non-self-representative thought, then each member of the infinite sequence, SS is a possible thought, S is a possible thought, is a possible thought, will be in the mindscape, which must therefore be infinite. A very similar argument proves that the class of all sets is infinite. The class of all sets is normally called the V or Cantor's absolute. We can use the willy 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 sequence of sets to see that there are infinitely many different sets. In, and this is willy willy. <laughs> Like they call it. There you go. <clears throat> Dedekind modeled his argument after an argument that appears in Bernard Balzano's Paradoxes of the Infinite. The class of all true propositions is easily seen to be infinite, for if we fix our attention upon any truth taken at random and label it A, we find that the proposition conveyed by the words, A is true, is distinct from the proposition A itself. So we can see that the mindscape, the class of all sets, and the class of all true propositions are all infinite. Does this guarantee that the infinite object exists? Not really. For a case can be made with a pluralist claim that, <clears throat> that the mindscape, the class of all sets, and the class of all true propositions do not exist as objects, as iniquities, excuse me, as unities, as finished things. In more familiar terms, it is not hard to prove that God is infinite, but what if you don't believe that God exists? It may seem hard to doubt that the more impersonal absolutes such as everything or the mindscape exist, but there are those who do doubt this. The issue under considera consideration is a version of the old philosophical problem of the one and the many. What is being asked is whether the cosmos exists as an, as an organic one or merely as a many with no essential coherence. It is certainly true that the mindscape, for instance, does not exist as a single rational thought. For the mindscape is a one, then it is a member of itself and thus can only be known through a flash of mystical vision. No rational thought is a member of itself, so no rational thought could untie the mindscape into a one. Into a one. Normally, the word set is restricted by definition to apply only to collection that are not members of themselves. Under this use of the word, the class V of all sets cannot be a set, for if it were, we would have a set V such that V is a member of itself. So V becomes a collection that can never be formed into a one. Suppose that we do not believe in a circular scale and assume that any physical thing is not a part or component of itself. Is the cosmos the collection of all physical things a thing? If it is, then it has to be a component of itself, which we do not allow. 
So the cosmos is not a thing, but only a many that can never be a one. There's a highly relevant passage in a letter Cantor wrote to Dedekind in 1905. A multiplicity can be such that the assumption that all its elements are, to all, are together leads to a contradiction so that it is a impossible it is impossible to conceive of the multiplicity as a unity as one finished thing such multiplicities i call absolutely infinite or inconsistent multiplicities as we can readily see the totality of everything thinkable for example is such a multiplicity again the reason that it would be a contradiction is the collection of all rational thoughts where rational thought t is that then T would be a member of itself, violating the rationality of T, where rational means non-self-representative. The upshot of all this is that God, the mindscape, the class of all sets, the class of all true propositions, all seem to be infinite. But it is at least possible to question whether any of these absolutes exists as a single entity. Certainly they do not exist as entities, that can be fully grasped by the rational mind. That makes sense. Connections. In this section, I would like to explore some of the connections between the various sorts of infinities that have been discussed. In his 1887 essay, Con Contributions to the Study of the Trans in Transfinite, Cantor quotes a passage from Aquinas's Summa and states repeatedly that in this passage, appear the only two really significant objections that have ever been raised against the actual infinite. Let's examine this quote from Aquinas here, reproducing Cantor's italics. The existence of an actually infinite infinite multitude is impossible. For any sets of things or any set of things are one considers must be a specific set, and sets of things are spe specified by the number of things in them. Now no number is infinite for number result, results from counting through a set in units. So no set of things that can actually be inherently unlimited, nor can it happen to be unlimited. Two, again, every set of things existing in the world has been created, and anything created is subject to some definite purpose of its cre creator. But causes never act to no purpose. All created things must be subject, therefore, to definite enumeration. Thus, even a number of things that happen to be unlimited cannot actually exist. It seems clear that Aquinas' first point is that an infinite set can occur only if infinite numbers exist, and he does not believe that infinite numbers exist. Cantor's theory of transfinite numbers stands as the only adequate response to this objection. For many years, it was believed that the notion of actually infinite numbers was fundamentally inherent. It was only with the birth of Cantor's theory in the late 1800s that a consistent and reasonable theory of infinite or transfinite numbers was developed. As Cantor remarks in his discussion of Aquinas' ob objection, this objection against the existence of actually infinite collections is to be met positively by exhibiting a theory of infinite numbers. It is not so obvious when Aqu what Aquinas' second point might be. It might be taken to, the, to be simply a variation on, on the first point. Under this reading, the first point says that any set must have a number of cardinality, but all numbers are finite. And the second point says that any set must have a purpose of significance, but any definite purpose is finite. If this is indeed Aquinas's meaning, then we can say that at one, that once against the Cantorian theory of infinite sets provides a positive rebuttal. Aquinas' whole view of the infinite is not really tenable, for he held that God is infinite, but that no created thing is infinite. This contradicts a widely accepted principle known as the reflection principle. The reflection principle, as formulated in set theory, goes as follows. Every conceivable property that is enjoyed by V is also enjoyed by some set. Recall here that V is Cantor's absolute. The class of all sets, philosophically it would run, every conceivable property of the absolute is shared by some lesser entity. 
or even conceivable property of the mindscape is also property of some possible thought. The motivation behind the reflection principle is that the absolute should be totally inconceivable. Now, if there's some conceivable property, P, such that the absolute, the only, the only thing having property P, then I can conceive the absolute as the only thing with property P. The reflections principle prevents this from happening by asserting that whenever I conceive of some very powerful property P, then the first thing I came up with that satisfies P will not be the absolute, but will instead be some smallish rational thought that just happens to reflect the facet of the absolute that is expressed by saying it has property P. Let me give an example of a reflection principle argument. For every thought S in the mindscape, the thought S is a possible thought. Is also a thought in the mindscape by reflection there must be. Therefore, there should be some thought W that for every thought S in W, the thought S is a possible thought is also in W. This W reflects or shares the italicized property of the mindscape. But note that this W must be infinite, so an infinite thought exists. Again, it is true that each of the wheelie wheel sets T is a member of V. By the reflection principle, there must therefore be some set N such that each of the wheelie wheel sets T is a member of N. Therefore, an infinite set N exists. The point I wish to make is that if one accepts the existence of any of the various infinite absolutes, then one is fairly well committed to accepting the existence of infinite thoughts and sets. For to deny the reflection principle is practically to assert that the absolute cannot be finitely described, which is most unreasonable. The passage from St. Augustine that I referred to earlier contains a kind of reflection principle argument for the reality of the set M of all natural numbers. In that pa passage, Augustine argues that God must already know each and every natural number and that he knows and that he even knows infiniteness in the form of all the natural numbers taken at once. Otherwise, the set of the natural numbers would exhaust his abilities. Of course, he knows it all because he, he is it all. So if, if you're, you're everything, then you're going to know everything. I mean, it's a little hard for the human mind to fathom everyone's, but that's well, but I would that's the only way I know how to describe it. God, according to Augustine, must lie beyond the set of natural numbers. To summarize the points in this chapter, summary. The infinite number one, the infinite normally inspires such feelings of helplessness, futility, and despair that the normal that the natural human impulses is to reject it out of hand. Two, there are, however, no conclusive proofs that everything is finite, and the question of whether or not anything infinite exists remains as open, almost empirical problem. Aeroplane. Three, there are various sorts of physical infinities that could actually exist. Infinite time, infinite large space, infinite dimensional space, infinitely continuous space and de infinitely divisible matter. Each of these infinites is, in principle, avoidable. Whether or not our cosmos actually does avoid infinities remains to be seen. In Cantor's set theory, we have a great number of infinite sets. This simple and coherent theory of the infinite provides a logical fra framework in which to discuss infinities. Moreover, if we feel that the things that mathematicians discuss are real, and we can conclude that actually infinite, infinite things exist. Attempts to analyze the phenomenon of consciousness and self-awareness rationally appear to lead to infinite regresses. This seems to indicate that the consciousness is essentially infinite. infinite. The absolute is certainly infinite, so one must either deny the reality of the absolute or accept the existence of at least one infinite, one infinity. According to the reflection principle, once one has an infinite absolute, one must have all, also have an inconceivable infinities as well. Let's see.
Okay, we're going to finish up on this on chapter one because we're nearly done. Puzzles and paradoxes. Answers on page 318. Okay. Okay, yeah, he's got some. Let me get here. So he's got the answers on page 318. Let me go back here and look. Okay, not I'll go down now. Okay, let me read it. It is sometimes said that if infin if infinitely many planets existed, then every possible planet would have to exist, including, for instance, a planet exactly like Earth, except with unicorns. Is this necessarily true? Let me see if I can get it. <laughs> <coughs> Let me try this. It is sometimes said that if infinitely many planets existed, then every possible planet would have to exist, including, for instance, planet exactly like Earth, except with unicorns. He <laughs> said puts in the unicorns. That's kind of funny. Um, I'm going to say yes, but I don't know if it be unicorns. Let me go check that out. See what he says. No, he said no. <laughs> no, it is not. We can see this by considering a numerical analogy. Let E be the universe of all even numbers. E contains infinitely many numbers, yet it does not contain every possible type of number to wit. It contains no odd numbers, although an exhaust collection of planets would probably have to be infinite. An infinite collection of planets need not be exhaustive. Let me see. Oh, I didn't say no. Okay, I was right. Or did I? Okay. Let me read that again. Sometimes I don't know. Go back there. Looks like this would probably have to be infinite. Okay, we can see this by considering a numerical be the universe of all even numbers. E contains infinitely many numbers, yet it does not contain every type of number to wit. It contains no odd numbers, although an exhaustive collection of planets would probably have to be infinite. Oh, he's just saying probably, not necessarily. Okay. Let me try the other one. Two. Consider a very durable ceiling lamp that has an on-off pull string. Say that the string is to be pulled at noon every day for the rest of time. If the start, if the lamp starts out off, will it be on or off after an infinite number of days have passed? Okay. After an infinite, well, if it's durable, but it's hard to say, I wouldn't, not necessarily. That has non off pull string. So String is to be pulled at noon every day for the rest of the time. Lamp starts out off. Will be on or off after an infinite number. I'm bad for that. The days are past. Let's go see what it says. The lamp, too. The lamp could, in fact, be either on or off. That's what I was thinking, but I didn't know. I don't pretend to understand a lot of that. The lamp could, in fact, be either on or off after infinitely many days. Information about its state after any infinite number of days is not, and that's, that's what I was thinking, but not enough to enable us to extrapolate past infinity. What makes this question interesting is that it is possible to give an argument that seems to indicate the lamp will be on, as well as an argument that seems to indicate the lamp will be off. Yeah, because he's going, oh, okay. But, uh, on the light starts out off and then we turn it on each time we turn it off off again we immediately turn it back on therefore it must ultimately be on each time we turn the light on we immediately turn it back off therefore it must ultimately be off this type of lamp is called a thompson lamp and will be discussed again later with reference to the grandy series okay let's go back to the number three i make a fool of myself <laughs> There. Okay, there we go. Three. For each observer O or zero, there there is some fixed upper bound N to the number of stars that O can physically see. Therefore, for each observer the universe is finite. 
Does this imply that the universe is finite? Let me see the, read that again. Oh, some fixed upper bound end to the number of stars that zero can physically see. Therefore, each observer to each for each observer the universe is finite. Does this no? It doesn't. Apply, wouldn't because. Well, you can only see far. I can only see so far. Back to three eighteen. He says, no, there is a temptation to say that if everyone thinks the universe is finite, then it really is finite, infinite, infinite to our minds. Indeed, you can't argue something like this in the first antinomy of pure reason, but the argument is fallacious. Just because each natural number is finite does not imply that the set of all na natural numbers is finite. Looking at this another way, we can point out that if there are infinitely many observers, then the combination of their various finite perceptions can also be infinite. Okay. Four. I have five fingers on my left hand. Okay. Means the same thing as when I count up all the fingers on my left hand. The last number I say is five. What I'm, what might I have fingers on my left hand mean? Okay, well, I'm just going to go see what this says. It would mean that you have infinity plus one fingers. I'm going to have to tell him that. He was trying to mess with me. Infinity plus one fingers. A curious thing about infinity is that you never count up to it. To count an infinite number of fingers is to count through every finite stage, but never to come to any last finger. If there is an infinite finger, then this comes after an infinity of fingers. Indicates that you have an infinity fingers plus one more. Interesting. I guess I don't quite understand that, but I never was good at that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Number five. Suppose that we find an infinite number i that is the largest possible number. But now, what about one plus one? Okay, let's see what he says. One plus one could not exist since it would have to be bigger than, or was that I plus one? I think it's one plus, okay. It would have, since it would have to be bigger than I, which was assumed to be the largest possible number. But whenever a number X exists, then X plus one exists as well. So if I plus one does not exist, then it must be that I does not exist. So we see that we can, in fact, Never find the largest possible number. This is a version of the Baralti 40 paradox, which is discussed later. A problem with our conclusion that there can be no largest number. That is, this looks like some, the absolute infinite. is supposed to be just that, the largest number. One way out of the difficulty is to assert the largest number exists, but that we can never get our hands on it so as to form this one. Okay. Much more to go. Okay. Number six. In the little known field of enumerative geometry, it is said that there are infinite points on a line and infinite points in a plane. There's said to be infinite two lines in the plane as well. To get the correct number, an infinite of straight lines in the plane, we must divide the number infinite four pairs of points in the plane by the number infinite of pairs of points on a straight line. How many circles should there be in the plane? How many ellipses? I'm not even going to try. In drawing an arbitrary circle, we have three degrees of freedom. The choice of the x-coordinate of the center, the choice of the y-coordinate of the center, and the choice of the ra radius. So there are infinite circles in the plane. An arbitrary ellipse can be drawn with exactly five degrees of freedom. Two for the choice of the center, one for the length of the major axis, one for the length of the minor axis, and one for the angle the major axis makes with the horizontal. So there are <coughs> infinite um, ellipses in the plane. Number seven. Can you prove without cir circularity that seven is a finite number? I bet she's going to say no, but who about prove me, right? 
Alright. <clears throat> yeah, that's number seven. Okay. He said yes. I thought that he was going to. If you say that seven is three plus four, and if you agree that three and four are finite, and that the sum of two finite numbers is finite, the kind of argument which is not <coughs> acceptable would be to say seven is the sum of a finite number <coughs> of one plus one plus one. Well, you get the point. For here, you are assuming that the given string of seven ones is finite, and this is just what needs to be point proved. By the same token, counting up to seven involves seven steps cannot be used in a proof of the finiteness of seven. It is abstractedly possible to imagine beings that count up to infinite numbers without noticing anything wrong. And number eight. The universe has lasted about ten, ten over ten years since the Big Bang. There are about three times ten over seven seconds in a year, according to quantum mechanics, the usual conception of continuous time does not extend to intervals shorter than 5 by times 10, 44 seconds. So we might think of this unit as being kind of instant faster than which nothing can happen. How many in instants of time does, does that come to so far? Is it reasonable to argue that largest numbers that larger numbers such as 10, 100 do not yet exist. Let's see what he says. 6 times 10, 60 instants so far. Whether one regards as real those numbers which could never physically exist is a debatable topic. My inclination is to say that the world of mathematics exists outside of and in, independently of the physical world, the actions of human beings. That makes sense. The quantum mechanical lower bound and unmeaningful time lengths is, by the way, sometimes called a jiffy, as in, I'll be back in a jiffy. <laughs> as mentioned, a jiffy is something like 1044, 1043 seconds. A discussion of the jiffy is found in Paul Davies' Other World, Simon Schuster, New York, 1980. I didn't have to read that, but that's the book that it's in. Okay. Number nine. Say that the space we live is an in, is in infinitely large, in is in in. Okay, let me reread that again. <laughs> Say that the space we live in is infinitely large. Consider an in, infinite line L contained in our space. L is infinity yards long, and L is infinity feet long. But since each yard is three feet, L is also three times infinity feet long. How can infinity equal three times infinity? I'll read that because I'm not uh, into uh, like the mathematics. The mathematics of infinity is different from that of ordinary numbers. In a certain sense, the ordinal sense, three times infinity, really is different from infinity. But in the sense intended here. The cardinal sense, three times infinity is precisely equal to infinity. Indeed, the example given is a proof of the fact. And number 10 of the puzzles and that he gives us. Here is an example of an infinite regress. Suppose that some person wishes to repair a tax in which every appearance of the letters man is replaced by the letters woman. If this is originally adhered to, then man and woman become woman, woman and woe woman, then woe woman and no, etc. 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 and so on and so on. What do you reach in? What do you reach in the limit? Full equality. I like that. With woe 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 with an infinite number of woes in each case. Okay. Well, I prove that I know nothing about that. <laughs> quantum mathematics or infinity, but it's still always fun to learn or read and expand your knowledge. But if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. Hit that notification bell and always stay safe and healthy. And please be sure to get on with me as I and my learning in Rudy Rucker's uh, Infinity and the Mind in Chapter 2, and that will be 2, all the numbers. 
please join me in my learning experience with Lil. Have a great day.